this is uh, a recording for the program of Code Road, one of the panel discussions. It's an international panel from shifting energy to shifting power. How do we go from shifting our energy sources and industries to shifting power structures? This panel will explore how different struggles against fossil fuels are connected to historic structures of power and politics. We will learn about the gas struggle in Groningen, tar sands in the UK, the indigenous Papuches fights in Chile, and power dynamics in climate justice organizing. By connecting these struggles and placing them in a historical and global context, we will explore what must be done to radically transform the conditions threatening our planet and lives. It's with Susanne Dalival, Sandra Beckerman, Stephanie Collingwood-Williams, Maria Railaf Zuniga and Shihiro Geusenbroek. I'm happy to see all you beautiful people here today. Um, uh, some of us have only just joined us. Uh, but we uh, started this morning uh, with a beautiful session, Gas Mafia, to look at um, the problems here in Groningen, uh, problems really specific to gas and very specific to the social impact uh, here in Groningen and the environment in which we find ourselves on this land that we are now guests. Um, and throughout the day, throughout the programming, I've seen some of your faces as well, we've been going to look um, a little bit more about the systemic nature uh, outside of Groningen. Um, we've looked at border racism, we've looked at energy democracy, and what are obstacles to get there, and what are uh, visions for moving forward. Um, so tonight, uh, we have amazing movers and shakers in the house, which I'm very excited about, I think. Uh <laughs> um, so uh, first I'm going to introduce the beautiful panel. Um, and maybe you can stand. Uh, and then we have two short introductions. Uh, and then we get the whole panel up here and we have questions and answer. And we're looking forward to a very interactive session. Uh, that said, um, we're looking tonight to discuss how we move from uh, the slogan, system change, uh, not climate change, to something that is actually uh, a practice of that slogan. Because <laughs> it's easy to put it on a banner, but it's quite hard to do that incremental change in a system that which is so monopolized uh, or is so locked in. There's so many lock-ins into that system. We're all socialized into that system. So um, we will have stories um, and those stories might be beyond a soundbite. They might be personal experiences, um, but we need to get beyond the soundbite and they might also be complex or painful or uncomfortable. Um, and before we start, I also want to do uh, a check-in. Um, we were going to have this uh, panel mostly in Dutch and then translated to English. But since we've had some problems with the translating technology, uh, we decided to do it mostly in English. And then when we speak Dutch, we'll do some translation to English, if that's okay with everybody. Yeah? Awesome. I love the hands in the air participatory. Yeah. Um, so uh, my name is Chihiro. I've been active with Code Road, uh, Fossil Free Culture and other um, uh, climate justice um, um, uh, collectives. Um, I'll be moderating tonight and I'm very honored. We have amidst us uh, Sandra Beckerman, a uh, long lasting local <laughs> uh, voice against uh, the gas industry working uh, from within the SP party, the Socialist Party, uh, to make a difference, uh, working on a, 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 a Zwart book, uh, also very much in tune with what is happening here locally. She will be able to speak a little bit about that more later. But please give it up to her Sandra <laughs> to be here tonight. <laughs> We're very happy you're here, Sandra. We love you. Um, uh, and this goes for the next uh, uh, panelist as well. Her, um, uh, she's uh, started in the climate uh, justice movement in Belgium uh, when she was invited uh, or she was uh, 
um, starting just with like bike demos, but from that she grew into uh, a grassroots activist, uh, both in anti-racism and climate justice. Uh, she sometimes works with Labo, a trainers collective. Um, I'm very honored I know her, and she's here tonight, Stephanie Collingwood-Williams. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, up next, uh, 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 I'm another person I'm, I'm very honored to call a friend. Uh, she's been uh, at the pioneering of the uh, organization 350 moving from the US to Europe and finding its way here in uh, another setting, um, really doing the grassroots upbuilding of, of this, yeah. She'll be talking to it uh, about that more herself. I'm stumbling over my words. Um, but it's uh, Emma from 350 doing European coordination of training uh, activists, empowerment, and uh, uh, capacitacion, the, <laughs> the ability training. Give it up for Emma. <laughs> And finally, we have uh, 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 another person I'm honored to call my friend. Um, she uh, she is from Groningen. She is from Chile, from indigenous uh, uh, roots, from uh, the Mapuche. She has been fighting for Mapuche people and the Mapuche diaspora. Uh, it's a foundation, Mapuche uh, Folio. Um, that uh, is united in 21 countries to find for fight for land rights, for cultural survival. Uh, give it up for Maria Dailov Suniga. So that is our lovely panel. Um, just because we will be talking about systems, and uh, system is such a simple word for a, a very complex and and um, locked in uh, infrastructure. So we do wanna highlight uh, two systemic problems that we are also facing. Um, and to uh, start that off, we have two introductions from our panelists. And I introduced them with a quote. Can we have the next slide? Oh, actually first, um, we wanna, with this panel, really move the discussion from an energy transition to a power transition, which is also move it from a climate activism to a climate justice activism conversation where uh, climate activism is typically uh, known for focusing on that uh, ball in the middle of the planet, be nice to earth, long live solar. Um, the climate justice uh, message is a little bit more focusing on like who's actually pulling the rope, can we cut the rope and how can we stop uh, systems of supremacy whether that is uh, white supremacy, human supremacy, uh, all these other different ideologies of supremacy that are keeping us from um, uh, a healing um, society, a society that doesn't destroy others, that doesn't need uh, other communities to be sacrificed for, for profit. Uh, so next. So um, one quote. Uh, from the Wretched of the Earth Collective is um, the climate movement will be decolonial or it will be nothing. Um, and uh, while this is a qu quote that really resonates with me, it's not something that is uh, necessarily obvious for uh, a lot of people who are in active in the climate movement. And that's why we're here to discuss it. Like, what does that really mean? Why, why is it so important that the climate justice movement is a decolonial movement? And to give that introduction, I would like to um, call to the front Stephanie uh, to give a little introduction. Okay, so um, I believe that um, climate change should be decolonial because we need to recognize the systems of power that are at hand. And well, colonial structures are still very present when it comes to who gets to live somewhere, who doesn't, and those class, race, sexism, etc., are all intertwined and make it important for climate change to see those factors, basically. Oh, okay, better? 
Yeah. I would just really hold it in okay. front of your mouth. Or that one? No, if you yeah. If you, oh. if you hold it very close oh, to your mouth, okay, it works. Oh, okay, very close. Okay. So, <laughs> as I just said, uh, we need to recognize the power structures at hand to be able to dismantle them. And racism and climate change are intertwined. As we see, we're refugees coming over here, which I will elaborate later. So people of color are most likely to be those that are placed next to power plants, next to uh, pollution zones. So they are also the, most, the first people to actually experience climate change. As we see in Asia, African countries, etc., they are the first ones to be, well, afflicted with the results. It's only later on that it comes to the global north and that they see the problems but it's already too late when they are actually faced by these issues. So as we've seen, um, as I just said, people of color are often poorer. Minorities are often poor in countries as the West and also because of the colonial history. Countries like uh, Ghana or other countries are very impoverished because of neoliberal connections. And then they are less um, strong or able to actually like, um, confront this in a positive way. For example, people that are uh, poor often don't have property, and when property is uh, taken away from them, they, uh, they are uh, the first to um, well build next to those communities, for example. Because climate change affects conditions and lack of certain things, it afflicts like farming, it creates wars, and there will always be more um, well refugees for climate reasons, which is well obvious. And with the far right wing, well, right wing, as we see today in populism, it is, uh, as we said in the conversation before, more border control, which is also, again, racism. And some lives do matter more than other lives, which is the link between Black Lives Matter, because people that are non-white often are not defended the same way as we saw, like, with uh, Dakota Pipeline, how we've seen it in, like, Hurricane Katrina, and those people are still, like, trying to get back to where they were, or the reactions when we see Flint or Puerto Rico, and when it happens to a neighboring country or somewhere close by, then it becomes more important or people give more attention to it. Also with uh, refugees, there's a lot of like blaming the victim and not looking at the problem that is capitalism and the system problem. So instead of addressing the issues, people will say, oh, the problem of climate change is people are making too many children, which is completely, well, racist also, because they'll be like, oh, those Africans or those people that are Muslims are making children, and not addressing the problem that is, well, a c consummation society. So climate change <laughs> is uh, also links to human rights. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, works. Wow. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so basically I think that um, only when climate change starts to hit the West, then it'll become a bigger issue and not when it only hits countries like India or then it's like not as important. So when it finally does hit the West, it'll be too late and now we're in business as usual. <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, I think we also really see that in our movement when, uh, for example, here in the Netherlands, we often see the, the phrase like to save our children. Mm -hmm. And it's like we, we are preoccupied in climate movement to save our children, mm -hmm. but not the people who are already dying, who died yesterday or demand justice for mm -hmm. the over 200 uh, climate crisis that already happened in Bangladesh, yeah. um, the outrage over that, uh, or the, the victims here in Groningen, is always put in the future, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. not so much in the victims who are already sacrificed mm -hmm. in sacrifice zones. Yeah, it's always put very far away, and people that are not like us are dehumanized, uh, yeah, which is still very neo-colonial and also the knowledge of people from the area is uh, seen as primitive and not as um, well constructive because the people that come and bring the knowledge like the book of James Scott will be 
unacknowledged in their knowledge because we know better than you, which is again very problematic. And it's saddening how to see that the global north who, that has actually created the biggest part of pollution that we see today still has and still kind of uses countries, African countries, etc., in like uh, taking all their resources and then has the odyssey to say, hey, this is what you have to do with your land because we've already destroyed our forests, etc. And now we're going to tell you to not uh, evolve this way because you're not allowed to. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, so final minutes. <laughs> um, what I was thinking is how Naomi Klein said we have to choose either capitalism or climate and how I think we need to be intersectional, decolonial, to be able to dismantle the system and how um, yeah, climate change has become a business, as we saw before, and we need to, instead of thinking about economics, people, and then Earth, we should look at what the Earth has, then what people need, and then like base an economy and not upside down. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> So I hear a lot of uh, also uh, uh, bridges to uh, to Groningen. What I've been hearing, like also criminalizing local knowledges, uh, like um, colonial. Uh, most of our colonial thoughts are about uh, Europe colonizing uh, Americas, colonizing Africa, um, but also the the dynamics between The Hague and Groningen are often quite colonial in its uh, in its way of saying, hey, you know, your heritage, your heritage, the 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 the, the schoorsteen, the, <laughs> the chimney, uh, when w you you need to get rid of it because it's not safe, and then replacing it with metal uh, tin uh, chimneys, uh, where that's destruction of their local uh, heritage of beautiful houses, beautiful little villages. Um, and these chimneys are actually not um, um, secured through uh, for lightning because they're from tin or like bliksem um, metal, metal. Uh, and you see a lot of destruction with the reparations of the houses that they're actually destroying because the architects that come in, they want to build modernity. And you see that in, in colonial uh, places as well. When they do... Uh, uh, repair something, it's always with the replacement narrative of coming in to replace you with our modernity and our ways. Um, that might be interesting. Um, so that, just for a little introduction to, um, to talk about decoloniality, which will pop up later in the conversation. Um, but another thing uh, I, w I wanted to start talking about is um, class and bureaucracy. Uh, so we have a quote for this as well to reflect on. Um, that was Stephanie. So it's a bit of a complex quote. Uh, I will read it in Dutch and then uh, move the next slide to the English. De heersende totalitaire ideologische klasse is de heerser van een wereld die op zijn kop wordt gehouden. Hoe krachtiger de klasse, hoe meer hij beweert niet te bestaan. Terwijl zijn macht juist wordt ingezet om deze claim te handhaven. Het is echter alleen bescheiden op dit ene punt. Want deze officieel onbestaande bureaucratie schrijft tegelijkertijd de bekroningswekkende prestaties van de geschiedenis tot zijn eigen onfeilbare leiderschap. Hoewel het bestaan ervan overal aanwezig is, moet de bureaucratie een onzichtbare klasse zijn. Dien ten gevolge wordt al het sociale leven krankzinnig. Guy de Boer. I will read it in English as well, which is the next slide. The ruling totalitarian ideological class is the ruler of a world turned upside down. The more powerful the class, the more it claims not to exist. And its power is employed above all to enforce this claim. It is modest only on this one point, however, because this officially non-existent bureaucracy simultaneously attributes the crowning achievements of history to its own infallible leadership. Though its existence is everywhere in evidence, the bureaucracy must be invisible as a class. As a result, all social life becomes insane. 
a quote from Guy Debord. And the reason I chose this quote to, um, to have the next introduction to class and bureaucracy is I think everybody in the room knows the word class and everybody knows the word bureaucracy. And we often refer to bureaucracy like, oh, so much bureaucracy, so much hassle. But in terms of our analysis, like what does this mean for our movement? What is uh, a bureaucratic system? What does it do? And um, class, not just as a, a, a position of like how much money do I have in my wallet, the way that class has been reduced to uh, a financial position, but also uh, class as a, 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 a working man or a capitalist in terms of power. And who better <laughs> to combine bureaucracy and class in the local context of Groningen, where we've had so much bureaucracy. Next slide. Um, like, I, I, don't, I don't understand this whole system of het gasgebouw, of all these different uh, loketten, all these uh, different uh, bureaus that all have limited liability. Um, so uh, I have this big question for Sandra. Uh, if she can talk a little bit about her vision about how we deal with um, bureaucracy and class in the context of Groningen and what we need to know about that system. I feel like I can only fail now <laughs> after <laughs> such a beautiful <laughs> introduction. Do you mind if I do it in Dutch? How much are you going to hate me if I start talking in Dutch? Yeah? Yeah, I can translate. Yeah, a little bit. Or I can translate myself, but I would like to address the Dutch people as well. Um, because can I start with something else, a small introduction? I'm going to do, I'm going to start off in English. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry, I'm a bit emotional. And because it's really painful to see this is my country. This is where I live and where I have been living uh, for the last 17 years. And it's absolutely devastating to see what is happening here in Groningen. I'm really sorry <laughs> if I get emotional. And it's really... Therefore, it's really good. I've been struggling this summer, and, and that is because we've been fighting for a very long time. And this month marks the sixth anniversary of the biggest earthquake we had been having so far. It's the earthquake of Huizingen. And last week, we celebrated the sixth anniversary of this earthquake. And there's still people here in Groningen that have their damages from that earthquake quake not being repaired and we've been fighting we've been struggling we've been trying to fight this numerous numerous torch lit marches numerous people getting together trying to fight this system and I think that after six years it's really devastating to see that we're still at this point still there are 10,000 people that are mentally ill due to the earthquakes. And it's really, it's really good for me to see you all here, standing in solidarity with us, because I guess that, yeah, after such a long time, people feel left out. They say, we don't feel that we are part of the Netherlands anymore. We've been used as a colony. To say something in Dutch, tot het merg zijn wij uitgezogen en ons recht is nog steeds een ijdel woord. En ik denk dat het heel goed is om jullie hier te zien, standing in solidariteit met ons, want het is heel belangrijk. Dit is niet langer over gas. Dit is niet over gas meer. Dit is over het systeem dat de mensen hier in Groningen Het is niet genoeg om gewoon de stoppen gas te stoppen. Het is niet genoeg. We've been used as a colony for over 50 years. Our government made 300 billions out of the gas money that came from our soils. And now that the problem started, people are, well, left to dry. And I wanna, some of you just arrived and maybe I can start with, well, some examples of what's been happening to people. And maybe um, the Groningen people all know him. It's Seibrand Nijhoff. And Seibrand Nijhoff is an 80 year old guy, over, he's over 18. He's living in a farmstead up north in Groningen. And he came to our parliament. And many people were 
sharing stories, showing pictures of their house, but not Seibrand Meijer. He came to Parliament with a bunch of cards. And he put a card on every table. You know what was on the card? It was the new address of his wife. They've been married for over 40 years, but they can't no longer live together because their house is so severely damaged that she can't stay there anymore. She feels unsafe, but he can't leave his house be because it has been in his family for generations and generations. His problem is not just the gas drilling, but how the government is handling this situation. And this is not just a mistake. We're fighting, we're fighting Shell, we're fighting Exxon, but moreover, we are fighting a government that's picking sides for Shell and Exxon. And Saibran Nayov, his house was damaged over six years ago, and he still, he's in a, he started a lawsuit against the state. He started a lawsuit against Shell and Exxon. And chances are that he's losing his lawsuit. And he calls me every other day, and he's feeling more and more devastated. And I think that his situation is the situation of tons of people here in Groningen. I made a little black book with stories from uh, over 80 people um, and their fights to get their damages repaired. But it's no longer just cracks in houses, it's cracks in people's souls, it's cracks uh, in communities. So what we need, and you were asking me about bureaucracy, because that's um, the starting point is, I guess, not even the gas drillings anymore. It's about our land being used as a colony, and the lives of the people living here doesn't really matter to our government. And I think it took a long time for people in Groningen, for many people here in Groningen to realize that. They were always thinking, okay, we are part of the Netherlands, we are part of this country. And then when the earthquake started, many people felt um, that they were no longer belonging in this country. And people tried to fight back. And I think the only solution after so many years, it's not just stopping the gas drillings, it's not just trying to repair the damages. We actually we absolutely need absolutely need this system to change. Because we are, yeah, we are here fighting the biggest companies in the world, Shell and Exxon, the biggest polluters. They're both in the top 10 biggest polluters in the world. And then we, as Groningen people, have to fight them. And I think, um, I think we are looking for ways to do that, to gain hope again, because it's, uh, I think we are not at a point that we are having much hope in. January, there was a major earthquake again, and then 50,000 people took the streets of Groningen. It was really powerful to see all the torch-lit marches, all the people saying, we need to win, we need to win. But we're not winning at the moment. And I think the only solution that we need to build, it's not more bureaucracy. It's not another, um, another uh, institution that's going to handle the damages. It's not another institution part of the state. We need to change the whole system at this moment. And I think, and that's maybe because I'm really glad to see you all here, because I guess that is what we need. Last year we had the people from Standing Rock here in Groningen on the very first day that oil was dripping through their pipelines. And you could see we are worlds apart, but we're so much the same. Our stories are so similar. Although they're probably fighting a far bigger fight than, than we are doing here, it was really warming to see that on there, the day that was so devastating for them, to see them here in solidarity with us. And I think uh, that we need to strengthen this bond uh, if we want, really want um, not climate change but system change. Um, but there's not, it's not enough to just come over here. I think we need to deepen this bond um, and... Um, 
we need to our um, our demands can't just only be um, stop the gas drillings and stop uh, or and repair all the damages. I think more is uh, necessary. Uh, I'm trying to work on that, but I think that the only way we can save Groningen is if the people of Groningen um, do it for themselves. Uh, and we need you for that, for solidarity. Um, uh, but we, well, yeah, I, think I can <laughs> say that. <laughs> um, yeah, and I can say something about this whole system, but I think it's pretty clear um, uh, that this is all in place. This is all in place to just crush the people. So they're giving hope every time now and then. So they're saying, all right, um, we're gonna uh, we're gonna give you. I don't really need that picture. <laughs> 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 I think she's forcing me to quit now. <laughs> no, no, no. no I was actually going to go to another uh, yeah. quote that was a little bit further. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, that uh, also binds bureaucracy with, because you took it to, I think, the, the essence already, the essence of uh, how do we relate to problems. And if we really want to deal with the essence of the problem, we need to relate in a long lasting solidarity, not a photo op, and also the despair, how real that is. And we need to also reclaim space for uh, the emotional um, realness of what trauma, physical trauma of, of an energy crisis and, and gas and numbers and statistics do on the ground. So I think you already took it actually to where we're going to take it next when we all sit here and we talk about personal experiences of how hard it is to do the work on the ground. Um, but just to, uh, to say a few words about the bureaucracy, which is why I put the quote in there. Uh, can you take it to the next slide? Next one. Next one. Uh, next one. Uh, yeah, um, this was actually um, um, uh, a follow-up from the bureaucracy quote. I'll, s I'll read it in Dutch and in English. Um, nu zullen er slechts weinigen nog steeds geloven dat het doel van de overheid is om ons te beschermen van de destructieve activiteit van bedrijven. Het moet nu eindelijk bij de meesten doordringen dat het tegendeel waar is. Dat het primaire doel van de overheid is om diegenen te beschermen die de economie runnen van de verontwaardiging van de gewone, gewonde burgers. Um, and I also have it in English. Um, surely by now there can be few who um, still believe the purpose of governments is to protect us from the destructive activities of corporations. At last, most of us must understand that the opposite is true, that the primary purpose of government is to protect those who run the economy from the outrage of injured citizens. This is a quote from Derek Jensen, and I think this uh, kind of captures also like what bureaucracy does. It it creates all this limited liability, these bumpers of like there's an answering machine, but nobody responding to your call, and you're just like, can I please <laughs> deal with a human being here? I have a problem and a heart, and why am I only getting a machine? And this bureaucracy as a layer is no coincidence. It's a way of not uh, dealing with you, of externalizing you. And I think you put the human face and the human experience already on that. But that's um, one thing that uh, I wanted to bring into the conversation, that bureaucracy is not just a word of frustration, but it's actually part of a class system. Mm -hmm. And the class system needs bureaucracy to uh, um, dampen the outrage of injured citizens, of yeah. injured people that have been sacrificed for capital. Um. Yeah, absolutely. I guess the government makes you feel that they just made a mistake. But this is their system. This is what they want. They choose sides. They already chose. They're on the side of Shell and Exxon. Um, they're not on our side. Yeah. So yeah, I guess yeah. it's pretty well put. And then uh, to go back uh, two slides. Uh, one more slide. Yeah, here. That was one more uh, thing. Um, why we start this panel with introductions is because oftentimes uh, we isolate climate uh, from the real justice part and we shout climate justice. 
but then we don't really take the time to actually center the justice part of actually looking at which system, how does a class system work, how does decolonial system, and of course we don't, we cannot do that in five minutes, but just to take time out for first naming these systems and saying the violations under systemic oppression is not violation for its own sake. All oppression is in the surface of resource extraction. So our collective homework is to dismantle the infrastructure of politics, economics, culture of systemic theft. And I have three pictures here from capitalism, squeezing the worker, from slavery, chaining the human being, from um, uh, misogyny of so much uh, um, um, uh, exploitation and unpaid labor and violence perpetrated against women. And those are not separate from the systemic uh, resource extraction that we see on our earth that we're fighting in our climate justice struggle. So with that, on the introduction part, maybe a little bit long, but I would like to welcome uh, all four uh, panelists to be on the stage and um, actually give a short introduction about their own work and how they deal with uh, the practical side. Because when you fight for uh, system change, it's so big, where do you get started? How do you not get stuck in just reading and reading and analysis, paralysis, uh, <laughs> where you're stuck in, in, in finding more clever words to name the problem, but not actually finding a way to get collective or not finding a way to be practical. So here we have our movers and shakers. Give them one more round of applause as they take the stage. And we need two more mics. Uh. So first I would like to ask the people who haven't spoken yet um, to introduce themselves, um, to say a little bit about, yeah. Um, some of the people here sitting on stage uh, are used to, to speak in front of uh, panels. Other people are more the movers and shakers behind the scene, the enablers of our movements. Um, so um, I'd really like to ask you um, to feel welcome to take up space and all of your voices are super important. Um, technical point. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Everybody be dry, mm -hmm. be welcome. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but later, my Is this okay for you, Maria? Yeah? Thank you for calling that out. We need collective care. So very, uh, thank you for that practical note. Um, good technical point. So I'd like to start with uh, Emma, if that's okay. Yeah. If you can share a little bit about um, your work and um, also some of the challenges and how you, you, you took on your yeah. challenges. Great. Thanks for inviting me to be part of the panel. Um, I think my work uh, begins with my own experiences of organizing um, and some of the struggles that have been involved in trying to be someone who's actively part of the movement. Um, I, I think one of the ways that I first stepped into organizing on climate change was actually coming to exactly camps like this. Um, back in around 2006, 2007, UK climate camps were going strong. And I went along, like many other people, to learn more about the issues um, related to climate change, meet other like-minded people, 
get trained in order to take action. And I think it's interesting when we're talking about this um, shifting of power and shifting of energy. We were being trained to take action to shift energy, but sometimes I wasn't able to find an ability to shift my own power in order to take that action. And I think my experience was often that whether it was intentional or not, sometimes I felt the space that I was stepping into and despite believing that direct action was essential for fighting the climate crisis, wasn't a space that I felt I could thrive in. Um, there weren't a lot of people at that time who I felt like looked like me or came from a similar background to me. Um, Chihiro was mentioning so like how we've been socialized and how we try and break that down. Um, a lot of my experience has been that direct action has been associated with very masculine um, traits, whether that's intentional or not, that's, um, yeah, it's how we've been often socialized, like feeling like we have to be on the front lines, we have to be chanting loudly, um, it's often been a masculine voice that's been doing that chanting, um, we have to be powerful and big. And that wasn't exactly how I would be able to find my power. And like I said, they didn't, I didn't see many women of color, um, in particular, um, uh, which is something that I needed to see to be able to step into my own power, um, taking up roles um, that I would have wanted to take up as well. Um, and so it actually meant I stepped away from direct action, um, not because I don't care about climate change, but because I was still trying to find my place um, in the movement. Um, and so the way I've been organizing has been shaped by that experience a lot because now when I step back into these spaces, I'm really trying to shape a space that people, no matter how they look or how they feel or no matter their background, can find that way to thrive and find their power. And that means changing some of the ways that we do things, diversifying the ways that we do things, finding, finding ways that, that no matter your, your class background, your cultural background, your racial background, your gender background, how you identify, um, that actually those things that our society has shaped to marginalize and put those, those identities and those experiences on the outside is actually re-centered and part of the way that we organize. And that's because that's exactly what can make us powerful and how we can how we can shift, pa like in order to shift energy, um, we shift our power by bringing that power from the outside right into the middle that has so often been put on the outside, um, on the edges. Mm. Um, and for me, in order to cli fight climate change, um, we're having to find completely new ways of understanding power and organizing power that is very different from those very systems um, that are crushing us. So I don't feel I have all the wisdom, but that's like, that's something that helps guide me. And you're bringing the realness and you're showing up and you've been showing up and, and you've like, I am so thankful for everything that you have had the, the courage and the um, longevity to build so much here in Europe. And just like you say, like, the women you see here tonight, when when you'd ask somebody on the street, you know, like who is a uh, who's a climate uh, climate warrior, who's a climate hero, who's a climate who's the top uh, top groene duurzame <laughs> persoon van Nederland, like the the most sustainable leaders, you know, you have the, the it's mostly white male and and entrepreneurial, whether it's El Gore, Bill McKibben, or um, more local people like Donald Poles from Amelia Defensi and n not going to go into their personal stories like whether they're cool or not but um, this is not the face that you are told that you can actually be uh, relevant to, you can bring your power to that space and I think it's very important that you brought that to us today <laughs> um, we'll come back uh, I would like to go to Maria, actually, 
and uh, ask you um, what are some of the challenges and what is uh, some of the work, um, the goals that you've been working on, like, you know, stepping up uh, for your community and what are some of the challenges you meet? Okay. Well, first I would like to thank Gouda Road for the invitation to be here tonight. Well, I think it's a really, um, we are very honored to be here. Is it, am I clear? Or, uh, must it be louder? <laughs> okay. I'm here today with my brother, Raphael, who is sitting over there with his poncho. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, we are very honored to be here because, um, particularly because uh, Mapuche Foundation for Leo uh, was founded here in Groningen. This is the earth, the place where um, 18 years ago, we thought we must do something for the struggle of the indigenous people, the Mapuche in Chile. So um, 18 years ago, we, we came together with my family, my brother, father, mother, and we thought we must do something for the people, for our people. Um, well, um, we were, 42 years ago, we we uh, ended up here in the north um, as exiles. We were banned from our country. Um, we as Mapuche Indians or Mapuche indigenous, uh, we are the people of the earth. Mapu means um, uh, land and Che means people. So it was really hard for my father because he was um, the people of the land to be abundant from his country, from his soil, from his mother, from his, from his earth. So it was a really a big struggle, but well, he chose, at that time he chose for his children, for, because we were little. And so we ended up here in the north, um, far away from the big cities, from Amsterdam. <laughs> And I think it was a really good choice of my parents to be here because he loved Groningen so much because of the, the, the countryside, because it remains her uh, to um, her own country, to Temuco, Lautaro. That's the place we are, uh, we're from. We're from Lautaro. I don't know if you know Lautaro. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really, really small place in Chile. And it was named... Um, of uh, a warrior, our first big warrior of the Mapuche people. Uh, left Raru means a really uh, fast hawk. And he um, fought against uh, the Spanish people. He fought against um, uh, the people, the Spanish who wanted to kill him, but he uh, has his own tactic. So he used the tactic to uh, defeat the Spanish people. Well, there's a long history of fighting of um, centuries and over and over. And now I'm here. I'm glad to be here and to do the work, um, to, to do the work of my parents because mm. my ancestors uh, fought for their land and my father fought like 80 years for his land, more than 50 years. He was imprisoned in Chile. He was tortured because he uh, wanted to come up for his land. And now I'm very glad to be here together with you. Thank you. <laughs> it's very beautiful. I noticed with myself that even um, as I was preparing for this panel with such a uh, feeling so honored to have uh, each one of you here, um, I forgot the power of the personal like we're talking system change, but part of that system change is like making space for those personal and interpersonal realnesses that allow us to be fully human. In one of our previous sessions, we were talking about reclaiming our humanity, and that's only through actually finding our humanity that we get to uh, do the healing work that is so necessary. And I think from each and one of you, uh, you're bringing uh, the realness uh, that we actually need to have a different approach to system change as well, where system change is not just like um, the system isn't a system of 
well, it is a grid, but it's you just can't bring a hammer and 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 slam on it until the system breaks. <laughs> um, there are certain things that infrastructure has a material realness that you can uh, break down, but there's a, a huge system of socialization of making people invisible of the real people, the real feelings, the real um, the realness, um, like how social uh, our social realities have become so insane and by showing up and actually be vulnerable I hope we can talk about some of the the difficulties uh, that we face in our work and um, I would just like to ask Stephanie and Sana to keep it short uh, but also uh, tell a little bit about the challenges and then we open it up to the floor so we get questions and people have an idea of who everybody is on stage to ask questions that uh, are uh, occupying your um, your campaigning, your realness, your um, your needs. Um, so uh, I really relate to the story you just said about not being represented in like a climate group. For example, I remember um, when I started with like uh, activism that I was the only person of color that was there, and that it was really hard for me to. Um, feel recognized in a sense because nobody looked like me and there's also like an element of classism where uh, sometimes in climate change movements there's a lot of like oh but I'm vegan and you're not vegan so you know or this kind of uh, elements of I can buy this or I can afford this uh, new kind of special climate bottle or these kind of things so there's a lot of like classism also in and racism that is sometimes also something you face within the climate movement itself. Yeah, that's something I thought that was linked to your story. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that into the room. <laughs> Reminds me of a story from Sandra <laughs> actually as well. <laughs> <laughs> the one you told about um, actually class and if you're, if you're poor and you don't fly or you don't have a big house, you know the story. <laughs> Well, yeah, but after these introductions, I don't really I know don't what to say because they were so very powerful. And I think um, my work, uh, I'm a member of parliament now, um, which... <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly that. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, I didn't want to be a member of parliament. <laughs> no, I was pretty happy here uh, working as an archaeologist here in uh, Groningen. Uh, I was trained archaeologist, but then I was studying all these um, a a primitive societies, and I thought, yeah, but my own society is cracking up at the moment, and I really need all my time invested here in Groningen. I'm kind of struggling to see how we can find new hope, so that's why uh, I'm really pleased to be part of this panel, and I think um, in the next couple of months I'm going to work on a um, what we call here in Groningen um, a Volkscongress. Uh, it's a conference of the people. Um, they were held in the 70s. Groningen was uh, pretty communist uh, by then. Uh, and they organized all these people conferences with our own demands. Uh, and I think that's uh, our next step uh, here in Groningen to organize uh, a large people conference, but also uh, in small villages. Because uh, I think that the most hopeful thing that is happening now here in Groningen is these uh, villages uh, like uh, Onder den Dam, uh, Overschild, uh, that are organizing themselves and making plans for their own future, reclaiming the power. Um, for example, there are people in Onder den Dam that are not only fighting the gas drillings and not only fighting for their own, um, their own uh, damages to be repaired, but also fighting for their own community, setting up uh, a new local publicly owned by everyone, uh, their own energy company. So also working on our own alternative. And I guess um, for me, I think that's the, that's the next uh, step. That's all right. Thank you, yeah, thank you. I think that uh, uh, it would be really nice to open the space and uh, see uh, what all of you have to say, what you uh, want to share, a, a short experience or a question. I we are with many, and in order to actually hear a lot of us, I would like to ask you to um, to do keep the 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 time. Um, and I'm looking. Can you walk with the mic? Yeah, because yeah? we are. 
there is a mic over there and it's very long. Uh, but if people can sta stand over there, then that's also uh, really uh, great. There's a mic on the steps. No, no, no. no on the steps. It's been... Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, we are recording this for a podcast because uh, Code Road would like to uh, share the inspiration. Um, so if there are people who would like to ask a question, and if you want to, uh, please do feel free to say your name and if there's a collective that you're part of, or a place that you come from that you would like to bring into the space and ask a question. I see a hand in the back. Uh, Talissa, could you walk? <laughs> yeah. We like to hear the, the the back of the house first. Hi, my name is John, um, and I'm from London, and a group of us cycled here to be with you. Uh, there's, there's Pat over there. She's the our leader, you can see most senior activist who's from Dorking. But anyway, my question is this. Um, uh, I was at the meeting this morning where they were talking about what this bureaucracy, NAM, the, the Shell, Exxon, the government, how they maintain their system, how the elites maintain their system. Um, what they do is the key strategy is they divide us. They're working to divide us all the time. They divide us according to race, class, sex, sexuality. The media is full of, inf you know, uh, of, of the war of each against each other, of, of people hating immigrants, people hating anyone who's different. And so they are, everyone is fighting each other than fighting the power. So. My question is, how do we overcome these divisions that maintain the system? Just a small question. <laughs> <laughs> so the question uh, about division and building unity, where we probably want to take it. Is there somebody who would like to respond? Oh. <laughs> Maria? Uh-oh. Uh no. Yeah. Okay. Little mic I think thing. it's... Mic check. Excuse me, your name is? John. Jo John, John. Uh, well, John, I would like uh, to tell you something about Chile, about the Mapuche struggle from our people in Chile. Um, as you told this, um, it sounds really familiar how uh, the system in Chile is uh, working and Argentina, um, because um, for us, uh, we've got the same problem because the Mapuche people, they are uh, occupied land or um, uh, fighting the big um, companies uh, like Endesa, Spanish companies and everything. And, um, and if you are in Chile, you see a lot of this, uh, what happens on the news, not just um, each hour, but like five minutes in every every single channel you see, oh, the Mapuche struggle, struggle, or oh, the Mapuche are doing this, the Mapuche are doing that. So if you are from the outside or from another country, or you're, you're seeing uh, Chilean television, it's like, oh, the, the Mapuche people, they are really um, like... Um, um, terrorists. Terrorists, exactly, thank you, terrorists. <laughs> they are doing bad things and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I think um, you should, um, must go. In, you, you you must um, to do things like this today to get um, uh, get on to. Zeg je dat? Kan het in Nederlands zeggen? Ja, jullie moeten um, de handen bijeennemen. Dus jullie moeten samenwerken. Want dat is heel belangrijk. Dus so it's so very important to to um, to oh go level. further with these actions like this. So to collaborate with different organizations like the organization of um, um, environment and to with uh, people like uh, li like uh, Esther, Sandra, sorry. This is really important because um, in the Mapuche struggle, we have a, a structure about eh, we we are the really good structure. That's why we um, fought against the Spanish people. That's why we could fight against the um, the the the. the um, the big companies, look, we like we are like clans in Chile, like uh, and the Irish people. You've got the Mac McDonald's, Mac uh, blah blah, Mac blah blah. <laughs> so we've got a really big, we are we are a very big clan. So we live in clans in Chile, 
and we uh, fight a lot. So we um, with a lot of uh, fights uh, between there are a lot of fights between the between the clans. But if there is a war, we just come together and then we fight against the we fight against the Spanish people. And in Chile, it will like like every every clan they has um, a lonco. A lonco means uh, the head of the community. So the Spanish um, uh, government. What they do is, if the uh, Lonco stands up and they um, come up for the people, they imprison the Lonco uh, when they are doing some land occupation. They set the Lonco pris in prison, and then there are no Loncos in the community. So, because of our structure, um, we can uh, search for another Lonco. And we are also have a Werken, this um, uh, people who is like me is uh, talking to the people. So I think it's really good to have a structure like here today. And I saw your website and see uh, your structure, like if you've got some uh, people who are juristen. And the do legal team. Yes, like a really big lawyers. team, I think. To, do <laughs> to have that team, if the government uh, will, if, if someone who doesn't want to work in this, you can put another one. So, uh, hoe zeg je dat? Voor de een komt de ander. Dus je moet een hele goede structuur hebben van samenwerking. Dat is denk ik mijn advies. <laughs> so there's a, uh, the last part was about having a strong structure of collaboration mm -hmm. and, and uh, to also um, fill in for one another so that you can't just take out one of the, the, the people mm -hmm. and then weaken the, the, the collective. Which is still coming back to the same challenge, but just realizing yeah. that these challenges are faced in all the movements. So now I see you looking, maybe you want to say something as well? Yeah, I think, John, you're absolutely right. This is exactly what is happening. It's the old divide and rule. Uh, and you see it very clear here in Groningen. So you get a dime, but you get $100. And um, they're always trying to break up bonds, not just between the Groningen people, but also between Groningen and the rest of the Netherlands. And I think our new minister is, is pretty good at this um, because Groningen has gained momentum. Groningen has gained support from people in the Netherlands. Um, but now our government is in placing uh, something like a ban on gas and the people in the Netherlands have to pay for it. So it's actually trying to divide um, the solidarity, undermine the solidarity from the Netherlands. And I think um, we really need to build our movements to, uh, to fight back. Um, I think two two things are really important one of uh, that's why i'm trying to to organize uh, a people's conference um and trying um because i think we really need to talk about what are our demands not just um stopping with the gas filling and and repairing our homes but what do we really want how do we see our future how do we reclaim our villages how do we reclaim our streets because that's why i said they're not just cracks in houses they're cracks in people's souls there's cracks in our communities so I think uh, we need to organize these spaces to talk about our demands. But secondly, I think, I think we need to support one another. And sometimes it gets really hard because people respond in different ways. If your house is torn apart by an earthquake and you don't know if your child is going to be safe when you put him to bed, people respond differently. I might become very angry, but my partner uh, might become very silent. Uh, I might want to fight, and he just want to um, say, "I'm going to, uh, I'm going to stop fighting." So people respond in a different way, and sometimes, um, sometimes that makes us fight our most beloved ones uh, instead of fighting our government and fighting this system. And I think we sometimes need to sit down and acknowledge this fact. And that's why last year I organized something, or I um, and now it feels like I did this all by myself. I'm sorry, that was not what I meant, but I, I was part of this movement called Flowering Resistance. And we planted, it started like this, five years after the earthquake uh, in housing and people lost hope. And I put this little message on Facebook saying, I want to give some people flowers that have been really heroes of our community. And something really weird happened. People started posting things, can you bring flowers to my wife? Because I think it's so, so she's so very brave and she's so very good at handling this. And these suggestions keep kept, uh, kept coming in. And I had hundreds of suggestions. I said, oh my God, I can't afford that many flowers. <laughs> 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 so I thought I'd do something else. And I asked people in the Netherlands to buy bulbs. 
And we planted these bulbs in a field saying Kop de Veur, and it means stay strong, stay united. And I know that bulbs are not going to scare the NAM, and they're not going to scare Shell, and they're not going to scare Exxon, and they're not going to scare our government. I know this. What is going to scare them is if we stay together, if we are going to fight this, or if we are united. And that's why I organized this, or uh, with other people, of course, uh, organized this flowering resistance, not because I like flower bulbs. I definitely don't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> no. Somebody <laughs> wrote that about me. A column from um, Fossil Free said that I might like to uh, plant <laughs> flowers, but it's not <laughs> not the case. I organize this because I think it's also we also need to sometimes stop and say a nice thing. Think about um, how much you respect uh, other people in our movement um, and say something like that. Be because I really think after struggling for so many years, it's really, really uh, mm. essential to do that too. Um, and w and w uh, it's a beautiful story and it's making it really concrete that there is no substitute for a relationship. Like, um, I don't know, I, I, I struggle with this a, a lot myself as well because I always try to understand the system and then to... Um, I don't know, strategize sometimes too much with my head. But if we lose if we lose each other, if if we stop relating, th there is no way forward cuz only through that union, which is the first thing that comes out of our collective like unity, you know, w on so many ways through deprivation and through isolation and marginalization. <laughs> I am the camp info <laughs> <laughs> line. You are live now. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, this is the camp info. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, can, can I help you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know the music they play in the elevators? Okay, so uh, I need some people to go to the kitchen, something about the water tower. If it's a technical uh, problem, can somebody from the room go there to check it out? This is calling from the... If yeah, somebody's going. Yeah, so peop thank you so much. Some people from logistics are now going to check it out. <laughs> yes, thank you for calling. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs> so I was saying, <laughs> there's no substitute for relation and <laughs> connection. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Um, so maybe we can take another question. <laughs> uh, could uh, I? Sorry, could yeah. I suggest something? Could I suggest that we actually take maybe two or three questions because yeah. the answers maybe might take a bit longer and we won't get a yeah. chance for a lot of people to ask. So I'm going to take two or three. Yeah. Um, yeah. I you I take the questions. I oh, 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 no, that's a lot of pressure. Okay, I, <laughs> I know I saw your hand like shoot up. So I'm going to just right here. Um, uh, so my name is Jana and I've been working a lot on activist trauma and recovery. Um, for me, what is more important than recovery? I mean, like, th here's your baseline and then something happens and then recovery is like getting back on the baseline. And I think what is way more important is resilience. So actually going through something and then coming out of it stronger and more united, etc. And so in um, like honoring your personal experiences and honoring um, all of your wisdom. I would like to ask all of you uh, shortly what resilience means to you. Okay, so we've got one. Uh, my name's Connor, I'm from the UK. Um, you said the word union a lot, a lot in the last section and I was just wondering where unions, as in practical working unions, uh, fit into the type of movement that's happened here. I'm very ignorant about the Dutch union movement, so um, 
because we had a situation in the UK that a lot of people will have uh, felt a lot of pain recently where Heathrow, our biggest airport, is being expanded further and our biggest unions are massively supportive of that and put massive pressure on our biggest political parties to support the expansion of the airport. And it just demonstrated how very far away we are from a integrated union and climate change movement, which to me seems absolutely essential if we're going to make the change we need to as quickly as we need to in a way that is kind of based in class and based in um, yeah, an understanding of social relations. One more question, I think. Uh, uh, hello, uh, I'm Klopfer, and I'm a photographer and an activist. And where I'm from, from Bavaria, uh, and the entire political left movements, there are only white people. And I often feel like there's not enough space even in uh, left movements for people of color or uh, minorities in general. So my question would be, how can we make minorities more visible in our movements? Yeah, we have actually four panelists and then we have four questions and each can answer one <laughs> to their liking. Um, <laughs> My name is uh, Antoine. Um, I want to ask to the, the, the movement here in uh, Groningen, but also to, um, you're from a socialist party, right? Um, what you have learned from your struggle here, and if the movement is also willing to support the anti-racist uh, movement in the Netherlands. And especially also the, the anti uh, uh, Swarte Piet or Black Piet uh, movement. So I'm, I'm very interested to, to see uh, what, what, what your take is on that. Awesome. I think we've got four interesting questions. Um, Emma, I'm looking at you as you making notes. Yeah. Um, so maybe um, you, you have first pick which question you want to uh, address and then you can uh, give your notebook to the next person and they can look at the question and... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be honest, no one's going to be able to read my writing. Okay. Um, I was... Um, well, I'm not actually... I'm not from Honingen, but I'm wondering if you'd mind if... Y it's specifically for her. Okay. Uh, why don't we Why don't we start with that one? Okay. Um, San Sandra, would you like to start with that yeah, one? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm struggling with this question as well. Um, I think, and Naomi Klein is not even a, a socialist, but she said um, that if we focus just on climate, we're doing nothing at all. Uh, we should engage in a in a broader movement. Um, and I'm getting more and more aware of that, I, I, I believe, um, is that we're not going to win this fight um, if we're just focusing on, on climate change itself. Uh, I read this article in Nature, which is, of course, not a, a system a, a critic journal, but for the first time, scientists um, made clear that we can actually reach the, um, the goal of the 1.5 degrees. And they said there's just one obstacle, and this is inequality. And I thought it's really weird to read in, in nature such a, um, uh, such a uh, anti-capitalist or uh, such a strong comment. And it makes me, I think we're even lacking behind as a, as a left-wing or, or a socialist movement in seeing this point where actually I think, um, um, yeah, uh, we might miss this point uh, in the Netherlands that we are focusing too much on climate as a... Um, as a uh, single issue, um, and, and I if we want to solve this crisis, we really need to build a movement uh, that puts inequality or fighting for equality at its core. Um, that's why, and I'm struggling with this, um, also with how you can connect. Uh, I think the Leap Manifesto um, is a nice example from from uh, from Canada. I saw an example in Belgium. And because I'm struggling with this, I'm organizing a conference on the 6th of October on climate justice. Um, I don't think that's the complete answer. 
Um, I am going to make one intervention because the uh, the question was specifically okay. a, about racism. And I, I, I just noticed somewhere it, it, it became a about class and inequality. And inequality has a strong in intersection <laughs> with how racism plays out. Mm -hmm. But I, I feel like somewhere along the lines in the answer, r racism got lost. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe that's my problem. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, mean, I think it's something we, we really need to discuss um, in the Netherlands, how we can um, build that movement in, yeah, um, that it's both fighting these uh, issues at the same time, um, anti-war, anti-racist, uh, anti-climate change, um, anti-gas links here in Groningen, if we don't link up and um, uh, we will never win this fight. I, I guess uh, you're making a very good point and I guess uh, I still have to uh, think about this uh, further. I would Maybe we can uh, discuss this further. Uh, I would actually on. say I would really like that. There is a, a good opportunity after this panel to talk because uh, Anton Dill is actually doing uh, very meaningful work in Amsterdam in uh, a debate house, Pakhuis de Zwijger, uh, to center um, non-Western uh, perspective, knowledge, um, uh, cosmovision on ecological. Uh, damage and ecological reparations. So um, I think you guys should talk after maybe. Would be really nice. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, moving down the panel because we're we're yeah we're time press. Okay. Um, I think uh, as has been said by a very I don't know has been said before. I think um, for us to be free, we need to all be free. And I think that's something we sometimes forget that all of us need to be free if we're gonna destroy this uh, system and we need to fight together and all become human for once, which I think is often forgotten. And I think that systems like white supremacy, like patriarchy, like uh, you know, heteronormativity, et cetera, are all systems put in place to oppress us and divide us also. And I think that we need to come together as one because it's our planet and we need to fight for it together. I think that's important. And uh, to answer your question about um, feeling like uh, the only one like in a very white space because um, climate justice and the climate movement is very white and often it, um, it doesn't see that it's white sometimes. It's funny, for example, uh, I've experienced in like an anarchist group, you know, everybody's wearing black and has like black tattoos, but you're the only actual black person there, which is very strange. And um, yeah, it's weird how sometimes a climate movement can reflect the thing that you're also fighting against, because if you're fighting against white supremacy and no, nobody realizes that they're white, it's very oppressive and not very welcoming for a group that is part of the same system we're trying to dismantle. So I think people need to be aware of their privileges and what makes them uh, who they are to also accept other people and not see it as uh, as like a, an insult because for, me to be black, you have to accept that you're white. And for, you know, everybody just needs to accept who they are and see how they can use their privileges to fight together and not against each other. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll talk a bit about resilience. Um, you were talking about trauma. Um, and I think uh, some of the experiences we have through activism um, there can be quite traumatic experiences, is what you were speaking to. Um, and I think just talking about this intersectionality that we've been talking about on this panel, about the interrelated things that, um, that yeah, the, the many different issues that we come across, like trauma can be held in many different ways or can come about from many different things. So we might experience trauma from going into a, a direct action, but also from some of the microaggressions um, that you might experience um, because whether you're a woman or if you're queer, um, can also be, can, can build up as trauma. Um, and I think just for me personally, I, I learned the hard way that the way that I hold trauma is in my body and that my body um, is very easily triggered um, and has a very physical response um, as a result of holding all these stories that we have of from the climate movement, from racism, from whatever it is, I hold it. And so 
I'm now working deeply to free myself from that and try and work, on, work with my body and not to hold it. Um, but rather than just using my body to take action, take body, like work with my body for what it needs. And I'm going to go, I'm quitting my job in two weeks and I'm going to go do a three month dance, intense dance program. Um, which is, doesn't mean I don't care about climate change. I do, but I know in order to fight it, I have to take care of myself in the way that I need to. Thank you for bringing that into the space. I think uh, that's actually a nice bridge to also um, one of the ways that God Road has grown this year is by actually having such a beautiful presence of a whole team of support and recovery here on site. And uh, I do advise you, uh, okay, uh, do advise uh, everybody to talk to the people from support and recovery on uh, the different ways in which they, they do their work because I think it's something very systemic for our own movement to, to do that he healing work and uh, the maintenance of ourselves uh, and each other. Like we say, put up a fucking fight for what you love. But it's like, how, how do we put up a fucking fight also for 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 ourselves, each other, like love that, um, <coughs> the stuff you need to be healthy, uh, to succeed, because we need to succeed together. Uh, and I'm talking to again too much. Um, please, the, the, the final question um, that final we have. Final question. Um, yeah, the role of unions in our movement. That's a summary of what your question was. And the pain, yeah, the painful role that unions are sometimes antagonizing when you actually want to grow with the unions because you want to grow people power. I think that's it's one of the painful elements that you kind of highlighted in Heathrow. Um, yeah, I'm looking at Maria. If there's something you want to say about that, gaat over vakbonden. Uh, en uh, het voorbeeld wat er gegeven werd was uh, van Heathrow. En dat uh, vaak als er weer een groei is van de industrie, dan wordt dat geframed als meer banen. En daardoor een soort van, hup, de vakbond uh, moet voor banen strijden, dus daarom moeten we ervoor zijn. Mm -hmm. En hoe dat vanuit de klimaatbeweging uh, eigenlijk heel, heel pijnlijk is, want je wil eigenlijk bruggen bouwen met de vakbond. Uh, de vakbond is een, een vereniging waarin je uh, people power wil uh, verenigen. Ja. Um, maar de, de vraag was om een uh, reactie daarop, uh, ja, hoe, hoe, <laughs> hoe we daaruit kunnen breken. Uh, dat is een grote vraag. Een reflectie. Sorry? Is there, maybe we can uh, actually uh, open it up for the crowd, for the collective intelligence, if somebody would like to respond. And I see a very <laughs> intelligible hand going up there. Um, so if we can get a mic to uh, the gentleman underneath the fossil free banner, um, who has a history of union activism, and always asking annoying questions about class and the role of the working class. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, my name is Martin. <laughs> I'm a union member, actually. <laughs> and I also uh, work in the uh, Dutch Union as, um, as a trainer. Uh, and um, I think the question was on the role of the Dutch unions also, like, in the whole uh, topic of climate change. Um, like uh, the highest authority of the Dutch Union is the, is the Members' Parliament and it always always makes resolutions on the main course of the Union and the last one was set last year in 2017 and uh, as one of its points it says that it wants to fight for jobs but it also wants to fight for green jobs uh, so it is actually like in the uh, in one of the main um, uh, charters of the union to fight for green jobs but uh, yeah obviously this is paper 
uh, and it's, it's uh, paper doesn't always uh, reflect in uh, reality, uh, also not in our uh, union. So to make this um, uh, to make this principle into uh, into a reality, there's also a lot of struggle going on inside uh, the union because the union is also a very complex uh, organization. Uh, and uh, not everybody in the union is for green jobs, but you, as we have this principle, there is a lot of political space to actually fight for it. Um, and the people who are making the fight are the members. So there is a small uh, climate group actually in the union made up of uh, members. Uh, unfortunately, it's a very small group, and uh, as it's also... Uh, the union, it's our general problem that many of our groups are uh, mainly composed of white, uh, old, uh, heterosexual uh, males. It depends a bit on the sector, but uh, yeah. Pointing also, also out some of the other problems within the union and yeah, power exactly. dynamics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, to change this and to also to make the fight, uh, to, to get the union to be more like an ally for the climate uh, movement, I would also invite people to come and join that group because the only way that the union is going to actually do something about climate change is if the members say that the union should do something about climate change. So we need our union groups to become bigger, to become younger, to become greener and to become full of all these wonderful people that are here actually in this space yeah. so that <laughs> we have like a fucking green and revolutionary union. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and then yes. I think it would also be relevant to think about the other way around, what we can do as a, clim as a climate movement to become more aware of class dynamics. Because mm. also in our organizing, in the words that we use, in the language that we speak, in the strategies that we uh, do, uh, our activism, uh, class uh, is very important. I mean, you really have to strategize on getting our uh, movement to become a more class-based uh, mo uh, movement, open for uh, yeah people from from the working class. So uh, I yeah, maybe I hear that two can, we can to do thingies. I hear one that there might be an open space session tomorrow about. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> no, that's just an invite that it might be something that uh, uh, a group of people would want to take up for an open space session. And then I heard earlier that uh, Sanda is involved in uh, organizing a climate justice um, uh, event or conference. So that might be something you want to also talk to Sandra about after we close this session. Um, uh, and I was just going to go for the closing part where I wanted to also, but I see a finger from... <laughs> No, I just had a also like a, a not a qu kind of a question. I'm using my power manning the microphone. You got the mic! But uh, I actually wanted to go back to the questions about resilience uh, because I think earlier, Maria, you shared a really uh, beautiful story about resilience in your family and you kind of talked a bit about kind of generational trauma and, and what it means for as a people, indigenous people, to carry that resilience through centuries. And so I actually wanted, since you didn't get a chance to answer one of the questions, I wanted to ask if you could also answer the question about resilience. Uh, als jullie het uitleggen, want dat komt eigenlijk ook terug in uh, de, het slotwoordje rondom uh, systeem, uh, systemic healing. Because oftentimes we talk about system change. But change is a very depoliticized word because it doesn't really give a direction. It just is this vague notion of uh, it's not good right now and let's change. So like one thing um, I, 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 I've been wrapping my mind and my heart around is like how can we do more systemic healing? And healing is a, is a direction. And healing, um, um, it comes from the same word as whole and holy. Like whole, holy and healing all have the epistemology of the same word. Mm -hmm. So like to, in my mind that works that if we are whole, if we are complete, that in itself is actually healing. And being that full, uh, that rooted, uh, is the sacredness in daily life. It's not a sacredness in some kind of God out there, but it's like the, the 
through the wholeness comes healing. And so I wanted to end with each of the panelists to say a few words about systemic healing, and that kind of touches on uh, resilience. So um, thank you, Talista, for bringing that in. And Maria will get the mic first, but um, the final quote around well. he sorry, um, the final quote around healing is actually behind us, which is from Winona Laduc. She's an indigenous um, uh, indigenous uh, politician in the United States. She was the vice presidential candidate under uh, Ralph Nader, um, and uh, she has written many books. One of them, All My uh, All Our Relations is definitely a tip for every climate justice activist to read. The removal of Indians from their land, the flooding of the Cheyenne River, <laughs> Standing Rock, Crow Creek, and Lower Burrow Reservations, and the subsequent leasing of those lands to non-Indigenous ranchers have all contributed significantly to the loss of self-sufficiency and self-esteem in these communities. The lesson is that the war on nature is a war on the psyche, a war on the soul. So what we need is systemic healing, um, leading to the question of resilience and healing. Mm -hmm. Well, um, our people, they um, fought a lot. So there's a, there was a lot of resistance and um, a lot of good times, but also a lot of bad times in the history of the Mapuche people. And I think um, one thing uh, was really important for us uh, still now in Chile, but also for the Mapuche indigenous in Europe, like us, like my brother, like me, is our proud to be uh, one part of the earth. And that's, um, we must really, we must um, believe in our moral compasses. Huh? So um, our belief in the earth is very important. And I think for my father as well, because he was imprisoned in Chile in the, in the time of uh, Pinochet, the dictatorship of Pinochet. And um, he didn't want to leave his country, but um, it was really a big um, straf, that a big punishment for him. But his belief in um, his children and also that his children will um, fight the battle, fight the struggle. And he believed in us, like um, my parents fought the struggle against uh, racism, ag against uh, colonialism against um, uh, land lost and everything. So I think our proud to be here, uh, like a Mapuche indigenous, is very important, uh, important. Our belief and our language, our tradition, our clothes. Yeah, it uh, means a lot for us to be here because it's from a grandmother. And I think she would be very proud that I will be here with you. So I think that is really uh, good to, to, if there are bad times sometimes with a lot of wars and everything. I think it's just to um, gather together. And, um, and the Mapuche, we also, um, like I yelled today, you strijd onze strijd internationale solidariteit. In the Mapuche uh, war, we also uh, yell a lot. <laughs> Can you do because, a Because, uh, well, we say we have um, in the Mapuche uh, language, the Mapundungu. They say always, if there one warrior, his name is a Toki, when he was killed, then they say if one Toki will kill, there will be 10 more in his place. <laughs> so it is a very big uh, thing in Chile. If we were on a demonstration or we, were, we have um, a congress like this, we always say, Mari Shiweo. And Mari, that means 10. So 10, the, 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 the number 10 is really, really important for us. Like we've got 10 fingers. <laughs> and if I give you a, f a hand, like ten, five and five is ten, so it's really um, important. Union. If and I agree, if, or if, I, if I say hello to you, I say Mary, Mary. Five and five is ten. So if we are uh, in a demonstration or something like that, and we have get very uh, bad times, then we say Mary, she will, and it means like we shall ten times we shall overcome. So I yell. If I say Mary, she will, the whole people say Mary, she will. Okay. Marsh you will! Yeah, 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 yeah! Marsh you will! Marsh you will! El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. It means like 
uh, united people the will people never be united, united will, will never, never be, be defeated. defeated. Be, you know. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Yay, 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 yay! <laughs> Which reminds me to the, they tried to bury us, but they didn't realize we were seeds. <laughs> That's another uh, slogan. Um, so uh, we're running out of time, and I think a lot of the beautiful uh, conversations will actually flow from this panel afterwards with each other in the bar, which I think we also look forward to. I think it should be mentioned that there's still music, and uh, the bar is the place to be after this. To continue, I also want to make a note that um, a lot of people arrived today and not everybody checked in at the info tent. Uh, and it's actually really important also for logistics because there's a maximum capacity that can be on this terrain. So if you haven't checked in yet officially, uh, please do go by the info tent to uh, check in for logistics. Um, with that said, um, I want to thank uh, the panel huh? and uh, ask if, if they're like, uh, what's that? Yeah, yeah, ask for, for your closing words. Um, I'd say um, don't tell people how to fight their struggle, but ask them how you can help. Because often when you tell people how to fight their own struggle, you're falling back into colonial and oppressive systems. Just ask them, how can I help you? Instead of telling them how they should do it or how they could do it better. Because then you go into like a primitive versus modern kind of system of oppression. So just ask them how you can help and listen would be good. Um, and I'd share a quote from um, a poet, a uh, woman, black woman activist called Audre Lorde, um, who said that your silence will not protect you. Um, and so I would just encourage anybody who feels invisible or unseen or unrepresented to find your own power to speak up, um, because it's through finding that yourself that things will be able to shift. And then I ask that other people who are on the other side um, are there to listen and stand in solidarity. And I think that connects very well to what, what you were sharing. Yeah. Um, well, I wish you a lot of Mapuche in a when that means Mapuche power for this Tuesday. And um, I see... Um, Talisa with a beautiful t-shirt, it uh, says, your mother. In <laughs> Mapudungun, <laughs> 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 we say, Nyuke Mapu. So a lot of Noen. And I, I love, I, um, I like that you signed with your mother. Yeah. So just uh, a lot of luck and uh, go on. Yes. Yeah, well, I just want to say, yeah, thank you very much for, for being here and standing in solidarity. I think uh, the t-shirt is brilliant, your mother, uh, but also think about the children here in, in Groningen because um, they've been going through a lot uh, and I think it's really important that we don't miss the children. I want to, uh, I really like the quote that you were sharing, so maybe I can uh, share one as well that I, I learned from one of the oldest members uh, of my party in the neighborhood working class neighborhood that I live in. And maybe I can do this final one in Dutch. Yes. <laughs> Echte hoop is niet je ogen dicht doen en denken dat het goed komt, maar aan iets beginnen en geloven dat het kans van slagen heeft. Um, and it says something like, real hope is not closing your eyes and dreaming about a better future, but starting something and believing that it can actually succeed. And it's not, it's something that I have to uh, say to myself uh, over and over again, and I hope uh, it can inspire you. Um, I'll be there uh, on Tuesday, but I uh, uh, wish you the best of luck. I think it's really great that you are here, and I hope that you um, stay involved uh, in this movement because we really need it. <laughs>